Hello again. We're going to pick up again on the lecture on marriage and the marriage process. I um, started it last night and uh, uh, the marriage part one. Make sure you read that. Uh, Jan either loaded it or she's uploading it tonight. I am in my office today. So I try to switch around from my office at home to my office back in the, here at the university. But with that said, let's pick up a marriage. Now, what I did yesterday was I provided you an extra, another extra credit. I guess you could say an extra, extra credit, but another extra credit that looked at marriage. And this was in marriage part one. So make sure you view marriage part one. And I also commend in my student, Jen or Jennifer, uh, for her hard work, and she continues to work hard. Remember, we have our big uh, Zoom uh, lecture discussion this week. So make sure you sign up. We have a Zoom lecture discussion uh, set up for... Um, this week so make sure you sign up we have a zoom lecture sign up and make sure you do that and keep track of your assignments as we have our assignments coming up uh pretty soon next week in fact now with marriage i ended by saying that there was a uh, dr john gutman or gottman excuse me and dr john gottman talked about the um the four horsemen of the apocalypse and I know what's the first thing you're thinking. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this uh, shade because you can't see my face. I hope that helped, but we're going to talk about the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And this theory had a profound impact on relationships, marriage in particular, as we moved into the uh, whole notion of, of marriage and what that means. Now, Dr. Gottman broke that by, down by criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. And what I did is I provided you, uh, I provided you uh, a nice short video, about two minutes long. And I can tell you it's going to be on the exam because I've always followed Gottman's work. And if you really want to get into Gottman, if you're thinking about becoming a therapist, uh, you want to become a family therapist, an individual therapist, a couple therapist, a child therapist, uh, Gottman's work has really had an impact on our society and it had an impact on couples and families and individuals. So. I recommend that you look at his work under Gottman's Institute. And uh, it's good work, very good work. But for now, I provide you a two minute, around a two minute video on the Four Horsemen. And Jen, Jennifer, she posted it yesterday, uh, last night. She posted it uh, under week three, module three, under communication. And it's a really good video uh, based on years of research. So with that, this idea, why do people get married? Now, people get married for the right, the right reasons. People get married for all the wrong reasons. And, you know, the, the one thing about marriage is this idea of why do people get married? You know, love and companionship is one of the major reasons why people get married. And I hope that helps. I hope that helps. I, I'm sorry. I apologize about the lighting. It's a little cloudy today, and it's just not working for us. But bear with me. Bear with me. Um, love and companionship is probably one of the major reasons why people get married and I think this is a good reason I think that there's a sense of knowing that, that you, you, you find that partner remember we talked about mate selection you find that partner Let me give it one more try yeah This lighting is just not working. Maybe it's a little bit better. There we go. You know, love and companionship. So, you, there we go. It's a little better. I hope. I hope that's. I hope that helped. You know, you find that partner, that partner you want to spend the rest of your life with, and you, you through the hard times, through the good times, this idea that you can have someone there who's supportive, 
someone at the same time provides feedback, someone who who is is not afraid to be to provide constructive criticism. Um, this is very different from the criticism that you find when we talk about the four horsemen. This more usually is negative criticism where the person is blaming versus constructive criticism where the person is there to help you grow as an individual. I think that's the big thing. Uh, so love and companionship. Children, by all means, I mean, depending on the person's culture, depending on the person's religion, uh, depending on uh, the person's background, you know, whether a, a couple's going to have children or not, that's not the point. But people do get married and there's that love and companionship and children do make the, the marriage rewarding if that's what the couple is looking for. And I think that's a key aspect of marriage if that's the couple is looking for. And I can tell you now, having three children and having been with my wife for 15 years, the children have definitely brought a positive aspect to the relationship, positive aspect to the relationship. And so it's very much um, this idea of uh, uh, very positive, very positive. So another reason why people should get married, uh, not get married, not should get married, but right reason is that if it's if it's as part of their belief system, as part of their culture, as part of their religion, that marriage, love and companionship, and having children as part of that, very good reason uh, to, to, to be married, to be married. Um, as part of my adult identity, um, I think that um, if that is part of one's culture, remember I said yes, in my part one marriage lecture was that even though identity in the sense of the um, single, being single, it has increased, the reality of it is the norm is still very much marriage. And those sense of my adult identity, adult, uh, adult identity, mm, adult identity, it does make, it does, for some cultures, for some people's beliefs, some value systems, or just for the self, being married is part of their identity, is part of their growth, is part of their lifespan, if that's what you want to call it. All right. Uh, you know, uh, this whole sense of commitment and personal fulfillment, uh, but not just as an individual, but as a couple, bringing what we call the marital dyad together, these two individuals bringing back, bringing together their identity, bringing together their, their who they are now, and coming to this to this this reality of of where it makes a difference. It makes a difference that this is my goals. This is my commitment to you. This is my community. It's not uncommon in weddings that you see people in the modern era where they use sand, you know, regular sand, you know, from from a beach or whatever the case is, and they blend these two different colors of sand, and they'll they'll blend the lighter brown and a, a more white base sand, and uh, they blend it and they make it into a combination. And where the person doesn't necessarily lose their identity of who they are, but they become one identity as a, a dyad. All of a sudden, they might, the person might change their name or they might have a hyphenated name. This is a fulfillment that they are now together. And I think that makes a difference. I think that does make a difference. You know, and so commitment and personal fulfillment for oneself and for one as a couple. Okay. Another thing, you know, um, uh, I think, in my opinion, the, the, this is a combination of important aspects of why people should get married. Um, why people shouldn't get married? I mean, I think the reason people get uh, people get married, and people say people get married for all the wrong reasons. Um, people get married for economic reasons. Although some people say, well, you know, we save money, we're together. I tell people that's not necessarily a reason you should get married. And actually, we know from the research that. Um, that this is not a good reason for getting married uh, for one reason that you know if you're based on the financial reality is that financial realities change all the time depending on the person's uh, employment or lack of employment uh, because of the person's aspirations and all these types of things and I think that's a critical aspect when you're looking at marriage that's economic realities you know I know people back in the day uh, you had arranged marriages and some may arrange marriages were based on financial uh, financial stability to bring families together. Royalty was was based on financial stability, and they would bring people together. Uh, in the old days, it wasn't common for when a, when a man, especially in the Western European part of the United States of the world, of Europe, and even into in in uh, Latin America, there was this whole European tradition of a diary where when a man asked for one's hand in marriage, he would bring some kind of financial wealth or some kind of financial stability to say, this is what I'm bringing to the table. This is why I should marry your daughter. And so we know in the modern era, and looking at Gottman's Institute of Research, that financially, 
this is not necessarily this is not necessarily the best reason why to get married. Um, and we're going to talk about how financially is the, one of the leading reasons why uh, couples have problems uh, during marriage in the modern era. Another reason why um, the whole sense of getting married and uh, not to get married, excuse me, not to get married, is the whole sense of social pressure. You know, you're late. You're in your late twenties now. You're you're thirty something years old. Why aren't you married? Now, I think this can only lead to problems because people start to get married for all the wrong reasons. Maybe their culture, maybe their value systems, their beliefs, maybe um, their religion, or maybe even society says, "Why aren't you married?" Although we're changing now, we're starting to find now that the single, like I said earlier, that the single single value systems, being single or singlehood is starting to be more approved and more accepted. It's still not the norm. I can tell you 20 years ago, if you went to a wedding or something, in the case you were at a social gathering, a large social gathering, where people knew each other and they knew each other well, or to some extent they knew each other, and if a person wasn't married, especially in their late 20s, early 30s, even in their mid-30s, people always ask the questions. People always ask the questions. And so people would get married for, excuse me, people would get married for the wrong reason. And I think this is critical to understand that there is this idea of, you know, the, the, the social reality, the social realities of social pressure of people getting married. And this was uncommon. And this often led to divorce. This often led to divorce. And a lot of the times of separation. And you, high, you had those high rates of divorce in the 70s and the 80s. And this was one of the reasons why. So another reason why not to get married. Okay, now. Transitioning, transitioning. One of the things about marriages and rituals and weddings um, is I've always appreciated this part of the, part of, the uh, of class and uh, weddings. And coming from, uh, as you know, I come from a Latino background, you know, the idea of rituals. I mean, just so many different rituals. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to see these rituals, these cultural rituals and values that are tied to them. And I'm going to give you some examples. Probably the most common one in the United States is the ring, right? The ring, which is a Western uh, European symbol, uh, to some extent Eastern European. And other parts of the world might use rings, but they might differ on what part of the hand they wear it on. And even in Europe, you'll find that. In the United States, commonly, the ring is worn on the, on the left hand. Now, I think what happens is this is a symbol of bringing the bond together between, uh, and traditionally speaking, uh, in the sense of heterosexual couples, although now we're starting to more and more and more about gay and lesbian couples, this was brought forward uh, for in the sense of heterosexual couples. Okay, um, and so this was a symbol. This was a symbol. Now, let me give you some examples of rituals within my culture, and every culture has them to a certain extent, and cultures blend them. Um, I'll give you an example. Blending the sand is really not so much a cultural tradition. It's becoming more of a secular tradition. You're seeing more and more couples engaging in this uh, blending of the sand, uh, the lighter base sand and the light and, and the darker base sand, and they're blending them. There was other traditions that are more secular based in the modern era that aren't necessarily tied to just one tradition or culture or religion or belief. Is the lighting of a candle, a uh, unity candle. You see these unity candles. The unity candle is used in different cultures and different beliefs and different religions and different denominations. And so the unity candle has become of a secular tradition. But my culture, in the case of Latino culture, in particular uh, Mexican culture, I can give you an example of some. Uh, for example, uh, when a man and woman were joined together in a wedding, you found that there was this, um, what they call lasso, which translates to rope. And at one point, there might have been a rope uh, with the cross at the end of it. And they would put it over the man, drape it over him, and then there was the string. And there was a little cross at the bottom of it, and then it was draped. The other part of it was draped to the woman. And it was to bring them together in a, in a social, cultural, and religious tradition. Another example was the Aras, which was very much a European tradition, especially Latin-based, Spanish-based tradition, where there was the sense of the diary that the man showed that he could, he could support his future wife, and he brought some sense of coins in the modern era, you don't necessarily see that. You see the symbol of a coin. You'll see coins, and they're generally not real. They're just like metal medallions and stuff, or or hard plastic medallions that look like metal. And but it's a symbol of that tradition. Uh, part of the one, the one I liked the most was the was the flowers to the Virgin. And in this case, the Virgin Guadalupe for Latinos, other Latinos who believe in the Virgin Guadalupe, 
uh, not just Mexicans, but other Latinos. And it was a sense of flowers to the Virgin was a symbol that the Virgin, you're bringing um, honor to the Virgin, uh, the mother uh, of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, you're bringing, asking her to ask her son to, to guide the couple, to bring safety to the couple and guide them to their marriage. And I always liked that Virgin uh, the flowers to the virgin. I always thought that was a nice tradition. This is some examples of some traditions, okay? Um, I'll give you another example that I've been exposed to a lot over my years and uh, throughout my childhood is uh, for African Americans, the jumping over the broom. This was a very much a tradition uh, for African Americans, especially during enslavement, um, where African Americans were not allowed to get married officially legally. You have to remember African Americans during enslavement were not even considered 100% humans. Um, and so the whole sense of a legal marriage on the plantation in the South was not allowed. It was not allowed. It was not permitted for someone to legally get married if they were considered someone who was enslaved on the plantation. And so African Americans started this cultural tradition of jumping over a broom. The couple would jump over a broom, and it was a symbol of their bonding together as a couple, but it's also a symbol of their extended family and their larger black community uh, bringing together. So the jumping over a broom. And with that, I'm gonna give you another extra credit. I give you one in the lecture one part, a marriage one part lecture, part one lecture. Um, and now marriage part lecture two, marriage lecture part two, excuse me. Um, I want you to identify some symbols of marriage. Now I've already given you the one, the probably the most common one, the ring, which is a very much a European tradition. I don't want you to use the ring one, okay? I want you to use other examples of symbols of marriage, of weddings, of rituals coming together. And so, you, you know, as typically a one page write up of these symbols, uh, you can connect where you found the reference at behind it as an appendices. Um, you can connect it to it as a separate page uh, where you found this and write up a page and, and talk about why you thought this uh, ritual or symbol, it might be part of your culture, it might be part of your religion. It might be a combination of your cultural religion. It might be a secular tradition. I gave you two of the major secular traditions, the lighting of the candle, the unity candle, and also the um, the uh, the blending of the sand. So basically right now, we don't want you to use the, the, the secular ones um, because those are real common. Um, the blending of the sand. And um, we don't want you to use the, uh, the, uh, the lighting of the unity candle. Um, the ring, obviously, that's probably the most common one. No, we want you to be creative. Now, if you just happen to be uh, your background and your culture includes the the um, the flowers to the virgin and uh, or the lasso or the alas because of your some land descent, you can use those whether you're Latin or not. But you need to talk about why you thought they were important, not why Dr. Ruben thought they were important. So let me rephrase that. No secular, none, don't do the two secular ones that I gave you. Blending of the sand, the ring, do not use those. And then if you want to use the Latino-based ones, whether you're Latino or not, doesn't matter, you can use them. But tell me why you thought they were important, why you thought they were, were nice and stuff. So there's some examples for you. But all means, there are many examples of, of rituals, of religious rituals and secular rituals um, uh, that happen during the ceremony. They actually happen during the ceremony. And the examples I gave you of uh, the, the bringing the flowers to the Virgin there, that's actually at the religious ceremony. Uh, the blending of the sand, of course, at the religious ceremonies. Some are time, they're done at the reception, and I may or may not sometimes they're not done at the uh, at the, the religious or secular um, bringing of the couples. So one page right up, page and a half if you want, double space, extra credit, on wedding rituals, marriage rituals during weddings. Um, love to see them, love to see them. Now, with that said, with that said, um, let's transition, let's transition. You, what you're going to find is that with marriage, I think uh, if you got to look at it from a lifespan perspective, a lifespan perspective, uh, um, you know, I think if you're going to be with this person for the rest of your life, if a person, if a person is going to pick someone, they're going to pick um, Karen or Michael or Emmanuel or Mohammed or, or, or Maria or whatever the case is, there needs to be a sense of compatibility. And this goes back to the mate selection. It's amazing on how much this lecture is tied to that lecture. Compatibility. 
there has to be a sense of connection. And remember I gave you the example of the extremes of the Jewish American person marrying the uh, Baptist person, but yet they've been married for a long time. There were other aspects of their relationship that made them compatible. The value system, there has to be these modern value systems, these beliefs, these characters, what you see in the world, your aspirations, what a person, excuse me, what a person sees in the world, what their aspirations are. These are things that are critical. These are things that are critical to the success of the marriage. You know, you see in the modern era, e harmony and match, and I talked a little about those in the last lecture on uh, mate selection. They're very true in the sense of statistically speaking. In fact, it's not uncommon. And I started talking about this before about when I originally wanted to be, when I originally wanted to be, um, um, sorry, I do apologize about the lighting. I am doing my best to work on the lighting. It's almost like I'm the, I'm the Phantom of the Opera. There is this one side of my face that's covered up, so I'm, I'm doing my best on the lighting here. Um, normally, my, the lighting in my office is actually quite good, but today, for some reason, the lighting is off. Oh, so, the, I'm the Phantom of the Opera today. So, now, I really wanted to, at the time to go on this whole sense of mate selection of pre-marriage, pre-marriage counseling and uh, premarital preparation. And I can remember when I went through premarital preparation back in in the late 90s and early 2000s with my wife at the time, my fiance, of course, and me being Catholic, uh, Hispanic Catholic, we went to the local Catholic church there in North Carolina, in Eastern North Carolina to be exact. And I can remember we went through a day long session of, you know, why people should get married, why, why they should be, why they're compatible. We did all these assessments, these marriage assessments, which is honestly what is what the modern day eHarmony is and match and these other things. Very similar assessments. We did them separately and then they gave us the results and they talked about why we were compatible and why we weren't and all these types of things. And so very mo the modern day assessments are based on a lot of those things. And what you find is, is, that, is that some people will go through extensive marriage preparation and other ones, it's literally a day. For my wife and it was a day, including lunch, of course. We found as a couple that we needed more. We needed more um, of understanding of who we were as a couple and how that was going to impact us in our married life. And when they're hiring a marriage family therapist who specialized, when she was there in North Carolina, she specialized in marriage prep and kind of getting couples ready to go, ready for marriage, or kind of getting them to really think about it. Should they even think about getting married as a couple? I mean, I'm not saying get married in general, but get married as a couple, those two individuals. And we went through six months uh, it might have been a little bit longer. It might have been eight months. It was intense. I'm not going to lie to you. It was intense. Um, but we really, really came down to the whole sense of we're compatible. We have same values, beliefs. I mean, sure. I just like I shared, you know, in my case, my wife, she's Latina, Anglo. We have very similar value systems, um, beliefs, social, cultural, to some extent political. These other aspects, they do make a difference. They do make a difference. And I always thought it was fascinating in your book. And I always see this examples about when you, you have the two it's the, it's the it's the cartoon where you the woman thinks that she can change uh the 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 one cat the, the the saying is okay can you change that person when they get married no worry about it we're going to change it when they get married and you have a picture in your book which i thought was a great illustration of you know where and um let me see your name my notes i wrote it down uh page uh, page 270 page 270 i wrote it down where you have two uh you have a you have a tiger and you have like a leopard and they're in love and and the joke is the birds on the side uh are saying well uh, you know that one thinks that they're going to change them in stripes and the other one thinks they're going to change their, their their dots or their spots excuse me their spots in other words you know this notion that i'll fix him i'll train him before you know once we get married no worries it really doesn't work that way. Of course, there are people who change and, and uh, personalities don't really change a lot. Uh, behaviors might change with the hard work. But what we do know is that those things need to be discussed and worked out before a couple gets married. Yeah, I talked about last night about how, you know, my wife and I haven't worked with students for years. Um, and in this class, I, yes, interesting enough, in this class, 2200, and as I've taught this class for uh, several years in other, at, at Bowling Green and my first university, East Carolina University, where I taught in North Carolina. Uh, and some of my students in this class actually ended up getting married. They met in this class and they got married. Um, what you find is that having gone to a lot of weddings, 
is and this whole notion of you know um, you know you get married young and I said it earlier that it depends that in the first lecture if you get married younger it's, it's going to be harder because you didn't really get a chance to grow as an individual but then again if you marry later and you were already set in your ways you know uh, people are like what well, does that mean you're 50 60 70 80 no of course not and a person being set in their ways could be in their late 20s and they don't want to change I think good example is my sister I love my sister love my sister she's also very honest with people she's She's now in her early 50s, and she talks about how the reason why she chose not to get married was she liked doing her thing. She liked doing her thing. She liked, she, she basically says, I'm setting my ways. I want to do my own thing. I don't want to make that compromise. And that's the reality of compatibility is, you know, this idea that you're willing, you're willing to make that sacrifice to be compatible, of course, but to meet someone in the middle, to sit in the middle. And I can remember going to a wedding years ago and I started to talk about this in the last lecture and I don't know if I finished it but I'll finish it now is you know they were clearly in their late 20s early 30s and it was an issue of immaturity and everything and they both had solid careers and it was an issue of economics and um, but they were both set in their ways and I remember asking my wife how are these folks going to make it because you could tell in the wedding in the actual ceremony that they were already struggling and I wondered about how much marriage prep did they go through did they go through a one-day session? Did they go through a weekend session? Did they actually sit with someone for a long period of time over the course of six months, eight months, a year, whatever the case? Did they do these, what they call wedding retreats, uh, wedding preparation retreats? Did they really work it out? And I can remember I was saddened because about two years later, two and a half years later, they had gone through a divorce. And um, I was saddened, but at the same time, as Scotland would talk about is these factors would have come out in marriage preparation. Um, and this is one of the major reasons why we had so much divorce in this country is that often people don't really go through these marriage preparations. Um, another reason why we had high rates of marriage, uh, excuse me, of divorce in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, and we'll talk about divorce as we move along, was the reality that, you know, people had stayed together for a long period of time when they should have been divorced, but because society said they could stay together, they, um, they stay together. I've always said divorce is it can be positive and it can also be negative in the case of my family my mother and father because my father was abusive the divorce was actually a very positive thing I would not be sitting here giving this lecture having earned my PhD from from Michigan State University um, uh, and if you were to see on my wall I have a Spartan hanging there it's, it's made out of uh, it's a great story because my my wife's family they all almost all of them worked at General Motors her uncles uh, General Motors company and one of them, he became a welder, a uh, specialized welder for, for General Motors and certainly with the vehicles and such things. And with the scrap metal, the leftover metal, uh, steel that was left over, he made me a symbol of the Spartan, the Michigan State University Spartan. So it was actually quite ideal because I came from a working class background, actually a very much a poverty background, a working class poverty background. And uh, he found a lot of people in General Motors Company over the years have been from that background. And he said it was a symbol of what he thought of me. Obviously, I went to Michigan State University, but he said this the scrap metal working at General Motors, the working class background. He said it's a good symbol of who I was. And, you know, just going back to that idea of compatibility, compatibility, compatibility. And I tell people all the time, you know, you can read all the books you want on marriage and weddings and couples and stuff. But if a person is not compatible with that other person, then how's it going to work? How's it going to work? And you know, I was saddened by the, 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 that, that couple because they were both really nice people, but they were both set in their ways. And two years later, two and a half years later, whatever the time was, they didn't make it. They didn't make it. And so I think this idea of compatibility and looking at it from a lifespan standpoint, you're going to be with the person for a long time. You know, you're going to be a person for a long time. Now, who's happier, men or women, when they're married? Well, your book does a good job about this, but I'm just going to give you a summary. What we find in research is that um, people who get married were already, to some extent, stable and happy in their lives. The people who have successful marriages, first of all, the people who had successful marriages, they had some sense of uh, stability with themselves. They had stability with them as a couple. They might have extended family. They might have friends, maybe a community, maybe a religious-based organization. Uh, the church, a mosque, or a synagogue, or whatever the case, they had an extended support. They were happy. 
And when they got married, and they, were, they became even more happy because they, now they had this companion and love, like I said earlier. At the same time, there were people who weren't happy when they got married and they took that into the marriage. Maybe they didn't have that extended support within their extended family. Maybe they didn't feel good about where they were in their lives and they carried that into the marriage with their partner. But happy, who's happier, men or women? What we find is that men tend to be happier in, in different ways because men, what we know is single men are less happy because often single men, um, they, they, they seek out the companionship. They might have their buddies, their male buddies, but we're talking about heterosexual couples. Um, but once they have that companion, uh, in this case a female, um, they sense that there's someone there to help them and work with them and, and care for them. Yes, the word care for them. There's absolutely nothing wrong for someone caring about you. This is an empowering thing. This is not enabling somebody. Someone who cares about you and, and, and is there for you. There's nothing wrong with that. Empowering, not enabling. Um, now, at the same time, often women are the ones who do that family work. They're the ones who are they're the ones who obviously if they have children eventually, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but women are often the ones who do what the emotional upkeep of the relationship, of the diet, the marital diet, of the marital family system now, because they're a family, because they're now married. Now, when we look at gay and lesbian couples, the research is quite different because the dynamics are different. You know, not necessarily based on male and female, but two females, two males, is what did they bring the relationship? Were they happy already? Well, did they feel safe? You remember, gay and lesbians are considered social minorities. Where do they live? Do they feel safe? Do they feel like they can be together as a couple and be open about it in the community or not be open? These are key aspects to gay and lesbian couples that often heterosexual couples, because heterosexuals are the mainstream, because heterosexual couples are the mainstream in our society, they often don't deal with these realities, these fears of what society might say if a gay couple lives next door. That gay couple, can we live in this neighborhood? If we do eventually have children, can we have our children in these types of schools? Can we live in this neighborhood? Can we live? Can we shop at these stores? These are big aspects that we're still thinking about. We're still learning about through research. The gay and lesbian couples have to deal with on a daily basis. And so, what we find is men and heterosexual couples tend to be healthier than men who are single. And the reason why is because there's a sense of someone's there. There's a companion, someone who loves you, someone who cares. Women on the same time, of course, they might be, women are happy, but at the same time, it can be very difficult for women when they're married because all of a sudden now there is that sense of, I have my companion. I don't, and I don't only care about myself, but I care about what he's going through. And then eventually when children go through, yes, women often do a lot of the work. And so there is that notion that when women are single, a lot of women are very happy, especially if they're career oriented and, and they actually have a career. We find that women are very happy because they care about themselves and they might have extended friends and family, but they don't have that specific, that one companion. And so your book does a good job about that. And especially when it comes to health, because what we find is that men are very well taken care of by their spouses, their significant others, their couple, their partner, whatever word you want to use. Now, as I said the other day, um, excuse me, what I said earlier, you know, and this ties into the reality of, um, eventual divorce or maybe no divorce is that you know within relationships um, you're gonna have uh, the extremes where in the, the four horsemen you know where people relate to each other they respect each other they um, they don't stonewall they're not defensive if they are they figure out ways to get around there as, as uh, to get through them, excuse me as, as Gottman said uh, in, in his work and you'll see what I'm saying when you listen to that short two-minute video but the extreme is domestic violence and there is a chapter in domestic violence that, that you will be looking at. Um, and it's, excuse me, it's part of your book. And this idea of domestic violence part of marriage obviously is not acceptable. And family violence is not acceptable in any, any means. It doesn't matter what the person's background is, socially, culturally, or whatever, economically, religiously, no one deserves to be abused. And having come from this background, having been around domestic violence, I can see what it can do to marriages. And it took my mom 17, almost 18 years to, to finally walk away from this. Now, this was in the 1970s when we did not have uh, women's shelters and women and children's shelters or family shelters. This was when we still had, we were still very much starting to, starting to discuss the, the realities, starting to discuss realities. And unfortunately, 
there are people who are married and they've stayed married uh, for whatever the pressures are, the social pressures, the economic pressures, um, the cultural pressures, the religious pressures, whatever the case, they've stayed married and they've been in domestic violence environments. And I always tell people, this is the, probably the worst environment a married couple can be in. And I know this personally because I grew up with it. I saw this firsthand uh, with my mother and father. Luckily, um, as, a, as a young boy, my mother, my mother broke away from my father. Unfortunately, I re-experienced it with my father and my stepmother well into my adolescence and young adulthood. I was well into my 20s when I, when I saw that my stepmother had been abused by my father. Um, even though my father had a very positive aspects to him, unfortunately, there was this reality that he was a perpetrator, he was abusive. Um, so I did see it throughout my childhood and then eventually again in my uh, adolescence and young adulthood. And I tell people that that is, that is not a reason for someone to stay together. And there are different reasons why people stay together. Um, and there's a sense of will, of violence and, um, and abuse. And uh, a lot of times people stay together because a person feels alone or scared. And then it, depending on other factors you kick in, uh, economic factors, cultural, religious factors, Although most religions now have, have gone against that and say, hey, wait a moment, people should not be together for this region, reason. Um, uh, I can tell you now, it, it took a while to get there. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s when I was a kid and adolescent, um, people, even churches, and uh, well, I was myself Catholic Christian, there'd be uh, ministers and priests who would say, no, you need to stay with your husband, you need to stay with your spouse or your partner, um, even though that person is abusive. We know we've gone away from that because most people, most pastors now, most priests and most uh, imams in, in Islam and, and rabbis and other leaders, religious leaders, uh, they've been trained in more of a mental health models and they've learned that abuse is not acceptable, that it's not good for the family, it's not good for the person who's being victimized or the children who are being victimized. So we know that in marriage there are these extremes. Uh, these extremes and uh, domestic violence is one. And, and I can say now we've come a long ways since I was a kid. And I'm happy to say that that I've seen that and I'm a survivor, I'm a survivor. What we do know is that we're moving towards more uh, in the United States, uh, egalitarianism, egalitarian, that balance between men and women, a balance in the relationship, respecting each other, a balance in the sense of family life, uh, family work, or children, having children, and if, if a couple decides to have children, respecting each other, raising those children, respecting the extended family, so on, egalitarianism. And you know, egalitarianism, I talked about it, when I talked about black families being the most egalitarian in the United States, the black couple, the in this case, the heterosexual couple, um, what we see is other couples, even though traditionally European American families and Hispanic families and Asian American families have been patriarchal, or in other words, it was centered on the man, what you're starting to see now is you're moving towards a more of egalitarian models uh, in those marriages or in those relationships, those uh, cohabitations or civil unions. You're starting to see that whole sense of, of balance between men and women and sharing the family work and the family life. And guess what? It makes for better marriage. We know this from the research. We know this from the research. Egalitarianism makes for a better relationship, a better marriage, especially with so much pressure in society now. Um, life can be more expensive. It can be it can be difficult to have a relationship, not marriage. Um, and egalitarianism brings that balance. Now, some people would say, but that's not my culture. That's my values and beliefs. I tell people, most people in the United States, um, uh, especially if they fall within European Americans and African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, and Asian Americans, um, and Islam and uh, Christianity and uh, Judaism and other religions, that there is room for an egalitarian balance. You know, I tell people you don't lose your roles and you don't lose your tradition, but you can balance that family work. And that's why I often tell students there's a sense of family work. The culture might have a larger umbrella definition of what that means. But a family within that one individual family, the Smith family, the Johnson family, the Gonzalez family, um, the Long family, whatever the case, um, there is that sense that you can have egalitarianism within different cultures and different belief systems. Um, and by all means, different socioeconomic statuses. So one extreme, the domestic violence, not acceptable. The other extreme, the egalitarianism, the balance, um, important, important. Now, with that said, let's look at it from a lifespan perspective. Let's look at it from a lifespan perspective. Um, we know that before uh, we know that before people get married, those first, maybe that first year and that first couple of years, 
there might be a settling process it's often called a settling process because maybe they were together for a couple of years maybe they uh, dated for two or three years or four years in my case my wife and I we were we dated and we were engaged combined for four years uh, it did create a process for us to get to know each other however once you get married and you make that commitment in front of your family and you know, community and society and you sign those papers and uh, whether a person is heterosexual or gay or lesbian and whether it's a civil union what you find especially with marriage whether like as i said heterosexual gay or lesbian uh we find that we, we start to get to this idea of all of a sudden now you've made a commitment you made this covenant you made this bond and i think that's important to consider i think that's important to think about it is quite different than just dating and it even is different than than, than the engagement process or that promising process sometimes called during the promising period um so the first couple of years can be a settling process, getting to know each other from that aspect. Um, if a couple chooses to have children, um, the first child is that whole sense of how do I have this new being in my, in my, in my in our lives? And you know, if the child is, is typically developing, or if the child has a disability, that changes everything. We know in the research that if a couple has a child that's typically developing, and then their second child, if they have a second child, has a disability, they're more likely to stay together than if the couple had their first child that has a disability because the couple is trying to learn to become parents and it, and, and it can be it can be daunting to, to raise a child with a disability depending on the disability because there are levels of disability because the parent is no longer just a parent. The parent is also the advocate for the child, not within just the family, but within the community, within society, within the laws that are written, within schools. And I had the opportunity to work with parents during my doctorate period uh, time at Michigan State University, I worked with families who had children with disabilities. And I also have worked after that with families with children with disabilities. And I can tell you now, some of the amazing parents, amazing parents, better than I ever have been a parent. Um, just the sense of patience and the sense of advocacy and caring for their children, depending on the level of the disability, um, there for their children. Not to say parents with children who don't have disabilities are not there. But you have to remember, an individual with a disability is a person who is a minority status in the United States. And everyone in the United States is within this category. doesn't matter, Anglo, European American, African American, Latino, Native American, Asian American, Asian Pacific Islander, gay or lesbian, whatever the minority status is, a person with a disability can be in any of those groups, similar to gay and lesbian, of course. But the person with a disability um, is growing up, depending on the disability, it often needs advocates, needs someone who there to champion their lives and, and care and often it is the parent and it often is the mother and so going back to my point you know early childhood often is what we call the curvilinear relationship a couple has a child and that relationship struggles 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 not in a negative way but it can be very difficult because you're raising young children they demand so much time from the couple and then all of a sudden that comes up comes up and you find that that age at school age that school age between um, um, six or seven years old, well into like 13, 12 years old, parents enjoy that period a lot of times. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm there at that age right now. My son's going to be six, and my older son is 12. He'll be turning 12 um, this summer. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm dreading adolescence because there's a major change in adolescence. But that school age period is it's a great time. Um and there's a reason why, because you find more independence from the child. The child's also some the child or children are sometimes looking for that role modeling. It's a great age. It's a great age. Um, in my case, I have three sons. It's a great age right now. And of course, my sons will become an adolescent. And as I told my son, you know, between I told my son between the ages of 12 and 22, 23, 24, you're going to need a lot of guidance from us. I said you don't remember when you were a little boy, when you were just a baby. Uh, into the age of five or six, you don't remember a lot of that. I said, you do when you were four or five, but when you're a baby, I said, you need a lot of care from us. I said, well, when you come an adolescent, there's a sense of guidance and a sense, of course, of independence, but guidance. And so for parents, that curvilinear relationship, when they have children, when they're babies, and then, you know, it dips, that time together, uh, um, uh, intimacy can be difficult because of sleep schedules and children getting sick, a child getting sick, and everything else that has to do with it. And then moving on into school age, and of course, adolescence, um, in it by its sense, is that whole sense of discovering oneself, 
um, that cognitive ability, as we, we say, abstract ability of young, uh, young boys and young girls becoming young women and young men. And it's a beautiful time at the same time. It can be very stressful for parents. I think the key aspect to having children, especially in the United States between the ages of 0 and 18, is having that connection, finding that connection. I can be years ago, the saying of keeping the flame going. I mean, it's a cliche now, but it makes sense. I would take it as further, further, and I would say that that flame or you have a campfire. And it's not just that couple. It's the people who support that couple. It could be extended family. It can be friends. And this is when we look at the Brown for Burner model, the family system model. Who are those support networks? Who are those friends? Who are those there to keep that fire going? So not just the flame from an intimacy standpoint, intimacy standpoint for that couple. But take it further than that. Take it further into the extended family. You know, where when that fire is, 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 is coming down to embers, who's there to help you? Excuse me. Who's there to help that couple keep that fire going? Not just for the sake of that couple, for the sake of the family, for the sake of the large extended family. You find now in a lot of religious organizations that that is their philosophy. Um, it's very collectivistic. That whole sense of, we're going to help you continue to keep a strong marriage, which in turn might, excuse me, keeps a strong family, empowers that family. So not just that sense of intimacy, of course, sexuality, you raise your character of sexuality, is an important aspect of it. This is very one, one aspect of it. So the flame is not just that internal flame between the two, externally, more of a collective way of looking at it. And people say, well, you know, you African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, and obviously Native Americans, the most collectivist of the people that we've been covering, the families we've been covering in this class. But of course, European Americans, all people, that whole sense of taking that, you know what, you're not alone in this. A person's not alone in this. And that marriage can, can, needs people to help at different times. When raising children, something as simple as, you know what, we're going to watch your children at night. So you can go get away for a little while. Or we're going to watch your children this weekend, whether it's extended family or friends, depending on the person's belief systems, social, religious, or cultural belief systems. So I look at that flame that what I heard years ago when I first started studying family, learning about families when I was like you, and I take it further from a collectivist standpoint. And I think that's critical. And I see those couples that have been together for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, I see that, that they didn't just make it on their own. They had that extended collectivist way to keep the fire going. So rather than flame, the fire. Now, the whole sense of, uh, you know, bringing, uh, you know, a couple, uh, you know, we call emptiness, emptiness, you know, that emptiness, uh, what happens? Uh, all of a sudden, those children are 18 years old, 19 years old, 20 years old. Maybe they moved out. And now it's just those two individuals who've been married for quite a while. What happens? Have they stayed connected? Have they kept that fire going? They might, they've might. they changed and grown. You hope they've changed and grown together. Obviously, people have their special different interests. But at the end of the day, are they strangers? And this is a critical aspect of emptiness, sometimes called the emptiness syndrome. Or are they just two strangers who pretty much just became mechanical or practical? We're raising the children and that's our focus. Did they lose who they were as a couple, as a as a dyad, as a marital dyad? This is a critical, critical aspect, critical aspect. At the same time, what we find now is that we have people who are getting older. And those boomers are getting older. And I'm actually going through that myself now as, as an adult with my family. And I'm going through what they call the sandwich generation now. My mother now is an elderly woman. You know, she's probably the great generation. She's in her 80s. But the boomers, it's the largest population that we're ever going to see in their later years. And they're starting to get there now. Now they're in their 60s, mid-60s. And who's going to be there for them emotionally, psychologically, socially, economically? 
But at the same time, I have to think about my children. So I find myself in the middle in what we call the sandwich, the sandwich, a piece of bread, something in the middle, two pieces of bread. The sandwich generation. It is it, it is going to become a major reality for my generation. And yes, if you're millennium or if you're my generation, if you're older, you know what I'm talking about if you're older. But definitely if you're younger, it is going to be a reality. And it depends on the person's culture and their social and religious beliefs. I can tell you now, collectivist people struggle with this. The biggest struggle for my wife's family was when grandma is now in her mid to late 80s. You know, what would happen? You know, she had her house. Um, she now has moved to a retirement center. And although it's not 100% perfect, at the same time, there was this whole sense that grandma after grandpa passed away, you know, a lot of her social connections passed away um, after grandpa passed away, and a lot of her uh, ties to the community are never are not there anymore. And so for Latinos, this is a big struggle. For collectivist people, let's rephrase that, for collectivist people, if you've always had these connections, keeping the fire going, what happens now? What happens now? Now, in her case, she's adapted well to the retirement center. She's making friends there and things are going well. But it doesn't always work that way. This is the big struggle for collectivist people. With, and this fall, I'll be teaching, or excuse me, I will be teaching a class called Abuelos, which means grandparents and Latino culture. And it's called Latino Families in Later Life. And I'm actually looking forward to teaching this course. It's going to be an English and Spanish course. You don't have to speak any Spanish because we have modules throughout the class that are English or Spanish, but then we all speak in English together. And these are some of the things we're going to wrestle with. And as a married couple, this is becoming more of a reality, and it's going to be a major reality in our America, our United States, in the next 15 years. Because those boomers who are now in their mid-60s, and they're married, and, and they have their family life, and a lot of boomers now, they're very different now. Boomers, retired boomers, couples especially, they have some disposable money, some, not all, of course, because a lot of boomers, when they were going through the job market, excuse me, through the job, those 30 years of working or a little bit more, um, what you found was the economy in the United States was very strong, very strong um, through the 90s, the late 90s and into the 2000s. And um, very few uh, aspects of recessions as we saw in the 08 uh, 2008 and definitely no depression like in 1930, 19, the late 1920s and into the 1930s and of course 1933. But this idea of having economic security because the United States was very stable economically and being able to use some of that money now retire these couples, these boomer couples, what you're finding is that they're having a good time. They're, uh, they're being involved in different things. They're not what I call your rocking chair grandparents if they are grandparents. And so um, I always tell people, my in-laws are a great example. They're not your rocking chairs type of grandparents. They're all, they live in Florida because my father-in-law struggles with his arthritis. But the example is they live in a retirement community. They're around all these folks who are their age and they're involved in different activities and things. And they're very much active in their lives. It's a beautiful thing. I, I think it's a great thing. And you're seeing more boomers doing that. But at the same time, those boomers are going to get older and that sandwich generation, um, you're going to find that where is the balance, the balance between the older generation and the younger generation, children and young adults, and the sandwich generation, the balancing of the two extremes. And married couples often have to balance that. Doesn't matter, heterosexual, gay, or lesbian. So it's important to look at it from a life standpoint, early childhood, when that curvy linear relationship where you're here. And it's like a you, think of a you. And because you have children, that, that and immense energy it takes to raise children and to make sure you you, sh you shepherd them, the word shepherd them, um, to, to be uh, 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 young adults, excuse me, young men and young women, and then eventually young adults. It takes a lot. It takes a lot on the relationship. And then eventually the empty nest syndrome. And is that relationship still intact? Has it changed enough? Has it grown enough? And of course, I just talked about the sandwich sandwich. Yeah. Now, I think one of the things is when, when we look at marriage, and what I've tried to do today is just give you some sense of marriage. Um, 
and how you know there is this iterations of looking at marriage. And I give you the extra credit about where you need to find an ideal marriage or for extra credit or what you consider a great marriage. They have to be married at least 15 years and above. Remember I said it had nothing to do with Dr. Ruben. Although it is a milestone that my wife and I are going to get to 15 years this summer. And it's a big thing. It's what my wife and I are really proud of because we worked hard in our marriage. But that extra credit, you know, that milestone, that, you know, extra credit saying, find somebody you has been married more than 15 years and you think that's a great marriage. You think, and write about them. Talk to them. Page and a half. The symbols of marriage, of weddings, and what it means, traditions and cultural and social beliefs, you can write down an extra credit. And what I've tried to cover today is just kind of overview on what marriage is about and the struggles and the challenges that come with it, but also the beautiful parts and aspects of marriage. Um, I understand that that people are choosing to stay single now. And that's perfectly okay now. My sister who's choosing to stay single, I'm glad that she was not pressured, socially pressured to get married because she's so much happier being single. But at the same time, the norm is still very much marriage. And I use the example where years ago there was a Coca-Cola commercial where the young girl, she gets a Coca-Cola to the, to the bride who's getting married. This was not a symbol for singlehood. This was a symbol for that whole sense of marriage. It's still very much a respected institution in the United States. Whatever that means, I tell people. Um, now you see in most states, excuse me, more states, you're starting to see the whole notion of gay and lesbian marriage. Is it totally accepted in the United States? Not necessarily. Remember, gay and lesbians are part of the new uh, minorities in the sense of, excuse me, not the new minorities, their whole sense of the new civil rights. Remember I talked about with Latino families and Asian families, migration and immigration being part of the new civil rights and gay and lesbian, especially the whole notion of marriage. And I always tell people, whether you agree with gay, lesbian marriage, gay or lesbian marriage at all, that's not the reality. The reality is, is whether you agree with it or not, it's here in the United States and different states are looking at it differently. And I can tell you in the different states that I've lived in, obviously New Mexico is one of the first states that have uh, civil unions and marriage uh, combination. Colorado recently a year ago, when I lived in Ohio, was it not acceptable? These are going to continue to be civil rights discussions in the United States. And I tell people, whether a person sits on this side of it or this side of it, in the United States, because we're a democratic society, and the way we've evolved this society in such a short period of time, 300 years, gay and lesbian marriage is going to continue to be part of the discussion. Um, and at this point, we're, it's based on states. And so going back to it, looking at marriage, whether it's heterosexual or gay or lesbian, although my lecture, and I, I do admit, my lecture focused mostly on heterosexuals because that's more than most of the research has been done, is that there is that commitment, that compatibility, that commitment, that lifelong commitment, especially in the United States because we have that whole sense of monogamy, that whole sense of one partner for life can be very difficult. And that's why I assigned that extra credit in the last lecture about finding that person, that, that couple's been together 15 years or longer, and you hope longer, and writing about it, because it is a major commitment. It's a major undertaking. And so, whether you're talking about, as I said, heterosexual couples or gay and lesbian couples, there is that major commitment. And if children are brought into the relationship, it makes it even more difficult. But at the same time, it makes it rewarding. It's a beautiful thing, I tell people to have children. Now, what I want to end today with is this, this whole notion of uh, communication and with um, I want you to review the 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 clips the two minute I did a good I, excuse me I did I try to give you a good example probably one of the best example of the four horsemen uh, Gottman's uh, four horsemen and the book com covers communication yes but definitely review the Gottman's uh, four horsemen and I do and I do that for you I do that for you in the chapters uh, excuse me, I do that for you in the, the link that Jennifer Jen connected under communication. Now, with that said, okay, well, our next lecture is going to be actually about parenthood. Talking about parenthood, um, uh, the parenting processes and what that means, going to give you some sense of, of uh, fatherhood. Um, often when people talk about parenthood, they don't talk about fatherhood enough. Uh, talk about some sense of um, some value systems in, uh, related to parenthood. In this case, maybe fatherhood at the same time. Talk about social and cultural differences, economic differences, religious differences, uh, parenting styles. And with that said, thank you. 
uh, it's an honor and uh, hang in there as I said it's our third week hang in there and uh, keep working hard we're here to support you